This is Mind Pump. Today's episode, we interviewed our good friend, Jason Kalipa. He's a major figure in the CrossFit world, in the fitness world, one of the leaders. And in today's episode, we talk about his vulnerabilities, family life, how to be a better man, a better husband. We talk about business, and of course, we talk about fitness. This is one of his best, most vulnerable episodes. He's a good man. You're going to love this episode. You're going to love listening to what he has to talk about. By the way, you can find him on Instagram at Jason Kalipa, and his book is As Many Reps As Possible. By the way, you can donate to his fund. He has a fund set up to help children. It's called avaskitchen.org. All right, today's program giveaway, Maps Aesthetic. To enter to win, leave a comment below this video in the first 24 hours that we drop it. Subscribe to this channel and turn on notifications. If you win, we'll let you know in the comment section. Also, this month's sale, Maps Anabolic and Maps Anabolic Advanced, both 50% off. If you're interested, click on the link at the top of the description below. All right, back to the show. There was the Minnesota starvation experiment. You're not familiar with it? No. Mm. So it's, it's so the, the Minnesota starvation experiment was in 1944 through 1945. The investigation was designed to determine the uh, uh, psychological and severe prolonged dietary restriction of the effectiveness of dietary rehabilitation strategy. So basically what they did is during the war, they gave people an option to either go and, uh, be drafted for the war, or they could be a part of this starvation thing. So what they did is they, they, for three months, they gave them 3000 calories a day, every day for these, uh, like 50 guys that participated after three months, they dropped them down to 800 or a thousand calories and they put them through manual labor for months. And what's really fascinating about this, if you read into it, is that these people that were normal people, when taking nutrition from like normal to starvation mode, after a certain amount of time, uh, uh, anxiety, depression, and, and all these thoughts start to like really sink in because neurologically they, their, their brain is no longer firing in the same way because your body is taking the, the fuel source from your brain and fueling it to other areas like your thought, like your glands that are necessary more so than your brain and your fingertips and your, it no longer can control your temperature, all that kind of stuff. So it was interesting for me that like you take someone who's just normal and you put them in this state and they could still develop those things. Then you take someone who's already like maybe preconditioned to it a little bit and they start not eating. And that's what we're seeing now. And it's really, it's really uh, daunting what happens in the brain more than anything that we could talk about. It's yeah. crazy. It makes perfect sense because um, one of the greatest, um, most common sources of stress and death uh, for humans, for most of human history was starvation, was just lack of food. So it makes sense that your all your alarm bells would go off Anxiety is an alarm bell. Um, all, you know, this yeah. like like hyper vigilance, like what's going on? Like I need more food and whatever. And then what you said physiologically, your body has to divert resources to essential functions, which means you lose other functions <clears throat> and um, you'll probably slowly lose your mind, you know, is, is what it looks like. That's exactly what happens. Yeah. 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 So scary, dude. It's scary because... <laughs> I sometimes think too that like uh, our our space we do more harm than good because it's, it's like it's almost like we have these these polar extremes either you're the extreme obese I don't give a shit about diet I don't exercise I'm I'm lazy I do of this or we tend to go the complete opposite extreme where we're measuring we're counting we're weighing we're restricting we're dieting hard we're training hard we do it's like when we need to find somewhere this this balance in the middle as, as humans we have a really hard time of of doing that we tend to live in these these polar extremes and neither one of them are are truly healthy and and arguably the one that looks healthy is sometimes maybe the most dangerous because it's, it's disguised so yeah. Yeah. it's obvious when you're sitting on a couch 100 pounds overweight eating doritos that's not healthy but it can be very deceiving that you know eating chicken or tilapia and you know asparagus four times a day and working out twice a day, how could that be bad? I mean, you're you're exercising and you're not eating Doritos, right? So you, you have to ask yourself, like, man, is 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 that one as dangerous or more dangerous because it's it's masked in health in a Dude, sense? Dude, for sure. Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll tell you what, I mean, going what I've through what we've gone through in the last like little while, I don't think I'll ever say to another person again, um, especially not a young girl, like you look you look, you look great, or you look like you've, I mean, I've never said to a or young girl, you look, you look, 
thin, like you thinned out. I've never have said that, but I'll never say to another girl, like a young girl again, like, wow, you've changed so much. You look great. I don't think I'll ever say that again yeah. because yeah. it insinuates and the, it feeds the value. That's your value. Yeah. And and it, it's, it's something that I think, um, we need to be more aware of, especially with the young girls and, and young boys, right? Just man, the, the whole journey that I've been on for the last like six months has just been very eye opening. Could continue. This is like, uh, yeah, you're right. It's not just girls. It's boys too. Uh, Sal's been saying this on the podcast for a long time, long before I even had my son that, uh, you know, when we talk about uh, health, fitness, nutrition around kids that you don't ever attach it to the way they look. It's always performance. You know, it's always like, oh, wow, man, you really got after it today. Like you, did, you must have fueled your body or like you always attach it to things like that and not this, how they look because you, you have no idea how they're going to interpret that. Uh, later on in life as they For get sure. older. Are you able to fill in a little bit about what, what you mean by what you're going through? Uh, yeah. So, you know, at a high, high level, I mean, I'll just start by saying this. Today, my daughter is currently four day, five days into a 24-7 residency for an eating disorder today, mm -hmm. right now. Mm -hmm. So this is like super fresh. We had obviously scheduled this podcast a while ago. I don't know exactly how I want to talk about this. This is all new to me, I, but I do know that talking about it and it is is going to be healthy for me and it's going to be also healthy for somebody listening. Somebody listening is going to be like, dude, I get that guy or I'm in that situation or I can now look for those signs to avoid it. And for that reason alone, I feel like I should talk about it. And I also want to demystify, you know, like I've, I've, um, my family and I, like my daughter had a leukemia battle for years and years and years. Oh, yeah. And you would get support all over the place. And, you know, but now here we are a couple of years later and I, it's not the same thing with mental health. It's like, I almost feel like when you talk about it with people, it's like, Oh, like, like you feel like you, you feel like you're on an Island cause you don't feel like you could talk about these things because either they pass judgment or they don't understand, or people are so afraid of it, they won't even have a conversation with you about it. So it's been very interesting um, working through this particular challenge. And I need to find a way to communicate it with people because whereas with leukemia, it seemed like everybody wanted to jump on and support. With this, it seems like uh, definitely our close family and friends, of course, want to jump on and support. And I haven't publicly put this out on Instagram or any of that kind of stuff, yeah. but it, it does seem like there's like this stigma around it. And I'd like to be able to demystify that because I've learned a lot of the last, you know, six What do you months. think that is? Do you, th what do you think it's like? I think people don't know what to do or what yeah. to offer. Yeah. And I'm not passing. Mm. Right. right. But like, I, how do I help you with that? Like I could help you. With, oh, look, can I donate? Can I, like, I, I know, but still that, you would you know? think the same. I don't yeah. know. Maybe it's because, maybe because like le leukemia like gets us and, you know, there attacks you or attacks the body. Whereas this is something that's like self-inflicted in a sense. And so people don't know how to handle that or communicate around that or what to do for you in yeah. that situation. Yeah. And like, even like that term, like I would, I would avoid using the term self-inflicted from someone with a mental illness, meaning like, and I'm not like, I'm sure, just yeah. saying like from, from what I'm learning now, yeah, yeah. it's like, it's like, dude, people with mental health problems, like those are serious problems. And these things like take over their brains and it's like a whole different person talking and within them. And I didn't understand it until I've seen it now firsthand. Yeah, and yeah. for that, I have much more compassion now than I did before. Like before I'd be like, dude, like why wouldn't the, you know, you see someone on the streets or whatever it is. You're like, why wouldn't that person just like go get a job or like, and I, I can't necessarily that Or Why would that person the eating disorder not just fix it? Like go eat food, yeah. but it's not that simple. No. And, and I'm learning that every day more and more and more. And that's one of the messages I want to get out is like, do we need to, as a, as a society, just have more compassion for people? Cause you never know what people are going through. And when that voice gets in their head, it's super strong. It takes over. It takes over and it, it takes over strong. Yeah. Were, so were there what, early signs? Like, did, what did, when did you start to notice any of this? Well, the reason why I think this is important to talk about is that we are in the fitness space. And many people listening to this podcast are in the fitness space. And I would caution people in the future, and this is just my perspective. I would I would caution myself in the future from doing like challenges or mm. like, so for example, I've done like a 40 day just meat yes. or I've done paleo. I've done every diet you could think of for me, right? But your kids watch and they're paying attention. They see everything and they hear everything. And I think in the future, I'll be much more aware of how we talk about those things or how if someone in your family is on a 
quote unquote low carb diet because they're trying to lean out for the summertime to look better in a bathing suit. I'd be much more careful the way I talk about these things in the future. And I think for people in the fitness space, um, you know, you ask about signs, you know, for me, it's like my daughter's been through a very difficult journey. You know, she was on a lot of steroids for a very long time and, and a lot of chemotherapy. And she came out of that and I was really encouraging her to exercise. And the whole goal was like, just move once a day. Let's just sweat once a day. And at the time I thought I was doing the right thing. I really did. Like I thought just sweat, just move. Like, let's just move. Right. And that turned into like something really successful, like, and really diligent and solid exercise. We were putting on strength. We were, we were, we were looking at as like strength is beauty, like, like building muscle. We weren't talking about like weight loss and running all the time. We were talking about Let's, let's train the way we all know how to train. And then, you know, the food started, you know, becoming like a, a really like beautiful diet. Like if any of you guys looked at me, like, holy crap, this person eats super clean, like not uber duper clean, but super clean, like would still have some dessert, but like for the most part would eat really well. And then over time, it just a little bit more restriction and a little bit more restriction. And then, and then we, we just saw like the restriction just from one point, something triggered that activity. And so my lesson learned for families is that if you start seeing these regimented things, okay, start paying attention, you've seen it. But then once it starts getting a little bit more extreme, I would encourage you to go find a therapist at that immediate moment yes. and not waiting because we saw this and we would be like, oh, you know, like we would try and handle it, but we're not yeah. experts in that space. Right. We should have... Uh, and I, I'm speaking for myself. I think we should have asserted another conversation earlier. These things flourish in the dark was what yeah. I was told. Think, think, uh, you know, uh, I have some experience with this and that's, I remember someone told me that like, you have to bring light to it, be, get other people involved early on. Otherwise it starts to flourish and grow in the dark. Um, you know, a lot of kids that go through this, a lot, sometimes it's body image and sometimes it's control. What you're telling me about what your daughter, daughter went through, she probably felt out of control for a long time. Chemo and steroids and all that scariness and what's going on for years. So this may feel like a way that she can, This I have this control. I can deny. Yeah. I can say no and I can reject the hunger. I can, I have mastery over it. And that's what it may yeah, maybe, like. maybe. I mean, look, every, every child's different. You know, I think that it didn't help the fact that she saw old pictures of her and she felt if she ate a certain way, she would look that certain mm. way. And, you know, how, what, how do you get to, when you go to a 24 seven facility, what do they, how do they identify that? Is it nutrient deficiency? Is it like, okay, we need to jump on this ASAP? Yeah. I mean, look, uh, I'm, I'm learning a lot of this process. I'm currently, uh, I just finished a book called sick enough. I thought it was okay. It was a little bit more medically focused. So for people who are like, it, it, it was a little bit more medically focused. And with the nutrients, it's just, once you go, it goes so fast. Meaning when you see the signs, then it escalates. Like we went to therapy and then it just escalated like that. I mean, and all of a sudden what happens is when you start depleting your body of these carbohydrates and, these, and, the, and food as a fuel, then your brain starts to not be able to function as well. And it just feeds the uh, eating disorder even more. So you go from like, it's just like, it's like zero to a hundred because you're, you're, you're here, you're on a, like a playing field. It's like a and, chain reaction. And then all of a sudden, right, your body isn't getting the fuel it needs over and over and over again for like a week, oh, two weeks, three weeks, a month. All of a sudden, then it no longer, then you're getting cold all the time. You can't regulate your temperature. And then all of a sudden your brain starts, stops functioning the way it should. And at that point, it's very, very difficult to reason with someone because they're no longer looking at it through a, that lens anymore. You can't reason with them because the, the disorder's taken over so strongly and their brain isn't functioning correctly. And that is a really scary time. Mm -hmm. And so that's where you got to, you got to refuel, you got to refeed. And there's a whole thing called refeeding syndrome. And it's a whole thing, but you got to get the brain functioning again before you could have any real, uh, forward progress. Yeah. Like the therapy won't work until we get you fed. Yeah. We, we got to get you fed. Things. So like in the hospital, for example, they do a, 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 a laying down blood pressure, standing yes. up blood pressure. Yes. They do a heart rate. And, uh, they also look at your electrolytes for this thing called refeeding syndrome, which is in either case, when you look at those variabilities from a metrics perspective, you're looking for certain things. If they think that it's not on target, 
you know, it's how it's long, how long does she have to be there? Mm-hmm. A while. Yeah. Until they did, de- they determine like, okay, we can move to this next stage type of deal. Yeah. 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 I mean, how, how hard was it to, to get her to even go to the facility? Was, was that really not hard? Sense? That's okay. the hardest part. Mm-hmm. Okay. Not hard. And I'm speaking from my experience. If you're listening to this, you're like, dude, my daughter had to do the same thing. It was the hardest experience of my life. I'd say it's been the hard, it's been very hard for us, mm-hmm. but she didn't fight us because it's like, you're talking to a shell of who that person is. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's, it is, it is been life changing for me in terms of I've dedicated my life to health and fitness. I started at the gym when I was 15, just like a lot of you guys. And I've seen so many people get life changing results from workouts and fitness, but seeing the way that nutrition, if not appropriately understood or managed, or if you don't get the fuel you need, the impact it can have on your brain has just been like something I've never experienced in my life. It's like, it's like. And, and so you got to refeed and then you got to, you got to quadruple the calories. Mm. So right now you're, you're, you're filling a hole. There's a, there's oh, dude. A, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then they, they get in this state of like, where they like, you have to like quadruple it. So like, she's, I don't, I don't even know. She's probably at like three, four, 5,000 calories a day right now. Like, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and it, and it needs to be that way for a while. Yeah. You know, um, I have four kids. I have two that are old, like older from a first marriage. So I have an 18 and 14 year old. And then I have two little ones. Right. And the way that I handled their food and how we talked about food was actually quite different. Um, One thing that I learned with the younger ones that I think I made a mistake with the older ones was, and and we're only like a generation or two into this. This, And so it's not necessarily our fault because you go to our parents, especially my parents, my parents were poor immigrants. Um, But you go back to my parents, my grandparents for sure. They had different problems to handle when it came to food. And it was... Hey, we got food today. We're not going to have it tomorrow. You better eat this type of deal. This is how my parents grew up because they were poor. This is how my grandparents grew up. This is in in Sicily. So they raised me that way, right? Like my grandma would put a timer, make sure you eat all your food in in this amount of time or they pay us money. So you eat the most. Like I grew up in this dysfunctional environment around food and I thought it was totally normal. So then with my older kids, I thought, okay, I'm going to talk about performance and I'm going to say, well, you can't eat this unless you finish this first. But that wasn't even the, 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 it was better, but that wasn't even the right approach. The right approach in this world, which is there's food is everywhere. Mm-hmm. It's everywhere. What you want to teach little kids isn't necessarily what's healthy and not healthy is you want to tell, teach them autonomy. So what you do is you create an environment where here are your options and you make sure that there's a couple things you know they like, but there's other things that they could try and then they choose and it's up to them. And if they just want to eat all raspberries today, then that's totally fine. They're not going to starve. That's for sure. And you continue to reintroduce and you give them the ability to feel autonomous. And then little by little, the nutrition stuff comes in versus what I did with my older ones, which was, this is healthy. This is not healthy. And what I did is I took the control away from them. And what they'll do is they'll try to exert that control back at some point, typically when they're adolescent, when they feel like they, you know, we all do that as adolescents. So it's weird, man. It's totally different than the way you know, previous generations grew up. It is not the same world where, where, um, you know, you, I also think what Jason's saying too, that we have to be careful. Sometimes it's not even what you say to them. It's what you do and what they see. Oh, bro. I mean, I mean, I I don't know if you know this or not, but there's, uh, as far as I know, we're the only fitness company nine years in business now that has never done a challenge or you ever used a before and after picture. We do never done it. And our marketing team fucking hates us for it. And everybody's condemned us and said you could be so much bigger and would have had way more success, but we refuse to do it because we understand some of these, these ramifications of that. And so it's not always what we say to our kids. Sometimes it's just the, what we do and the way we act in front of them, you know? Yeah. And I think that, you know, again, something I've had to take to, to I, I was, I was beating myself up about this really bad. And one of my business partners is like, look, Jason, out of anybody I know, he's like, you're the guy who works out a lot but you eat everything, whatever you want, whenever you want, you just, you, I don't, I don't can, um, like I'm the guy who, like, if you had cookies right here, I'd be down. Like it doesn't bother me at all. And I thought that over time I've, I've done a good job of teaching balance to the kids, showing them that we need to get movement in. I, I, I thought if you had asked me, I think that we have done an incredible job, but there's always things you look back on. You're like, people pick up on little subtle things. Also people might, it it might be environmental factors. Like I, 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 the point I'm trying to make is as parents, we need to be aware of all of these things and really reflect on them on a more regular basis. What are my kids Mm -hmm. consuming? What are their friends talking about? 
what type of other factors. And then if you see certain signs, little things, you got to intervene and shine light on it. Like you're talking about immediately, yes. like not a month, not two months, no. not three months later, immediately is, is my initial takeaway. Also, where I'm at when you're, when you're talking to your daughter, was she able to articulate what she was going through? Was she able to articulate like, um, you know, uh, how she was perceiving food and, and all these things, like, was there any kind of open dialogue with that or was it very much like yeah. a shutdown? Well, no, cause it, it started off slow and then it sped up really fast. So, you know, it started off with, you know, her assumption was that carbohydrates were bad mm. and her perception became reality. Meaning like the, the disorder just takes over you and it's something that I've never, like I said, I've never witnessed it before. And it gives me a lot more perspective when I'm talking to people about this type of things, because it's a voice and that voice becomes very strong. And so, yeah, we tried to have those conversations. We really did. But the more conversations we had and the more we try to navigate it, it just seemed to just escalate very quickly. Mm. And yeah, you, you, look, uh, I, I know I beat myself up a lot over, uh, you know, you're, I think if you're a good parent, you do yeah. not saying that you're supposed to, but I think you care so much. Yeah. How can you not yeah. look back and be like, what did I do? And all that stuff. Yeah. But you don't know that, that like she, like she got leukemia at a young age. Yeah. Okay. That you, you can't control that. That's a trauma. She went through that process of fighting that and came out victorious, but that was a very challenging situation. Now she's in a situation where she feels, I'm telling you, she feels like she may have control over something. Mm -hmm. So, and I'm telling you this not to beat yourself up, but rather you're probably the best dad to have in a situation like this. It's hard as fuck, but you're probably well, the best guy to be in that, you know, like, well, and, and, and that brings up a really good point, man. It's like, you know, I have, and just like all of us sitting here have had to overcome challenges in life, right. whether that was competing at the CrossFit games, uh, having gyms shut down during COVID that really sucked. Uh, obviously leukemia thing was a pretty big deal, but this is another challenge. And this one's been really, really difficult because of the point you were making earlier where you want to just be like, dude, just like, come on, just, just, just like, why don't you just have this? Right? Like, it's not like the physical change. Like, it's not like someone broke their arm. It's right. like, wait, why, why can't you just like snap out of it, man? Right. Like, you know, and that's been the hardest part, right? Because you, 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 and then and, and it affects the way they are and, and the way that they show up. And it's, it's, it's hard, but everything we do, I believe in more today than I did a week ago. And yeah. I believe everything in what we do today more than I did five years ago. Meaning I believe that working out fitness, training hard is, is the thing in our control to prepare us for when life gets difficult. And I'm, I'm a firm believer in that. And as of lately, I am immediately waking up hitting hard cardio, sauna, cold plunge, and it sets my day. Before that, I wasn't doing it very well and it was just affecting me. Now I know that every day, whether it's these train hard men's club meetups or whether getting after it, I'm trying to put myself in the right mindset to show up for my family, to show up for my friends, to show up at work the best I can. And I know that if I do that, I'm in a better spot. I was just going to ask you, what, yeah. what, how do you, how do you manage the personal? Cause I mean, I have uh, you know teenagers and little ones and you go through your challenges and that's hard, man. How do you, what are you doing for yourself right now to, to, to keep yourself going? Well, I mean, it, yeah, yeah, this, this has been a very difficult situation. I, it's, it's funny. Cause if you, if I had had this same conversation three days ago, I don't even know if I'd be able to talk to you about this, mm -hmm. but I just kind of came to the conclusion along with talking to some close friends of mine, like, do I have no other option? Like yeah. step the fuck up. Let's get this going. Like, this is the way it's going to go. Like we are going to, we are going to beat this just like we beat another stuff. And we're going to get through this as a family stronger than we did before. And that's my mindset, but I need to back up my mindset with intentional action, meaning like understanding what's in my control, focusing on educating myself, and then also taking care of myself and prioritizing my own fitness. And so for me, it's not the drugs and alcohol or any of that kind of stuff that I fall to. It's for me, I want to use fitness to lean into more to get me in the right mindset. Yeah. Anything that the the therapist or the doctors are shedding light on that that's new or that you didn't understand? Like, what are you learning from them right now? Like, are are you feeling very supported by them or are you feeling like an, on an island where you have to figure this out yourself? Like, I think in the beginning, we felt like we were definitely on an island in the beginning because, and the book I was reading, uh, we mentioned it earlier, it was called Sick Enough. I almost felt like that's the way it was. I felt like the system is broken in the sense that like the kid isn't sick enough. So there is no, there's, there was very difficult to find help. And we, mm. we were not limited by insurances or finances or any of that stuff. We were trying, yeah. but the kid wasn't sick enough. 
And mm. so the, 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 the support system wasn't quite there. And I feel like, um, that's something I'm learning about the system, but in regards to, um, the therapist and whatnot, it's just learning how to talk more effectively to the children, learning how to talk more effectively to both my kids. Um, and how the relationship want to have around triggers and stuff like that stuff that I would think would be like kind of fluffy. If you had asked me like maybe like a year ago, it's not so fluffy anymore to me. Yeah. You, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, like, yeah. Do you, are you <laughs> it's seeing, very real to me. Are you seeing someone yeah. for yourself, a, a therapist for yourself? Yeah. So I, I've had like a, I hate to, I, the best way I could describe this. If I'd have like a, I've had like a sports therapist for years because of competing in CrossFit games, mm -hmm. which then led me into having him work with me for business. But I am now pursuing someone specific for this type of thing. Because this guy could help you optimize performance, yeah. you know, lead your team. But that's totally different than what I want to talk about, yeah, right? Yeah. I want to talk about this stuff. You have, so do you I'm, have someone or are you looking for someone? I'm like, oh, well, I have like a few resources. I got someone for you. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's important because uh, as a parent, you have to have that support because it's hard for your kid, man. It's hard as a parent. You got to, you, you don't know what to do, what's the right thing to do and what direction do I go and I'll oh, fuck, I'm not sleeping and you know, okay, what do I do? How do I do this for myself now? And it's crazy. I mean, considering you're yeah. just now going through this, I feel like you're, you're in a pretty good headspace. The fact that you, you do seem to have empathy for yourself. You do though, still at the same time, take ownership of things I could have done better. I mean, it, I feel like you are the right dad to go through this, you know, <laughs> well, as shitty as that is. Right. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's kind of like one of those things I, I wrote that book and we talked about this a while ago called Amrap mentality. And, and after my daughter got sick, I, I basically wrote this book. I had an idea for another book and I wrote this book basically saying like, if anybody was going to get sick, should have been us because we had our fitness in lock. We had our finances in lock. We had our close family relationships in lock because we dedicated time and attention to each one. We were really prioritizing mm -hmm. each one in our life. I still feel that same way today. Um, I don't wish this on anybody. I don't wish this on ourselves. Like, and we're currently going through it. So it's not yeah. like I'm talking about this in the future, yeah. you know? Do you, have a, uh, do you have a spiritual practice? No. So, I mean, that, that's, that's something I actually wanted to talk to you about in the future. Um, no, you know, so you used a term, I was listening to you not that long ago, you used the term Christmas Catholic, Yeah, I think you called it. Yeah. So my family and I, we, we, my dad came from Iran, my mom um, came from Rhode Island, she was, her family's from Sicily, actually, and uh, I was raised um, Catholic, my children go to Catholic <laughs> school, but uh, I don't think we, we don't, we're not, we're not as deep into it, you know? Mm -hmm. So it is something that I explored when she was sick with leukemia. And now it's probably something I dive into even more now. Yeah. It's uh, it's for me, it's provided a tremendous sense of um, uh, guidance and meaning and purpose. And it really takes a lot off of you a lot. So we'll talk after. How, yeah, man. How, how's the, how's the other kid taking it? Like, how's that? I mean, that's a, that's a whole nother layer, right? Is he right. older or younger? Younger. Yeah, younger. Okay. And that's the whole other layer about like being a dad. You know, it's it's funny. Uh, um, so in 2008, I started a company, CrossFit company. We opened a bunch of gyms. We did a bunch of things. It's underneath the NC Fit umbrella. Um, about six months ago, we started launching. In January, we actually launched a brand called Train Hard. And what it was about for me is not for gym owners and coaches. I'll get back to your question, but I'm just kind of mm -hmm. sharing how I get I'm there. with you. Is that we launched Train Hard. And Train Hard is a online app, but also a community, mainly for men, but also a lot of women have engaged it about this theory of like train, protect, provide. That's like what I'm, as I've evolved in my fitness journey, that's where I'm at. Meaning like I grapple regularly. I, I, I train in the gym and in the garage because I want to be able to protect my family, meaning run, jump, climb, fight if necessary. But I want to have those skills. Like if my, haven't you seen those videos where like a stroller is going in the street and yeah. the guy has to run to it? Like, yeah. I don't want to be that guy who can't run. Yeah. That's important to me. Yeah. But what's also important to me is to provide. And when we think about providing, it's funny. Most people think about it in terms of money. And I think that's a factor. Like if you show up, if you work hard, you show up at work, you have more energy, you have more whatever. You're going to, you're probably going to make more money. But also providing experiences like going and doing stuff. Like my son, every day I get home, let's go play football. Let's go do this. Let's go do that. I want to have the fitness to never say no to him. So train hard is about protect and provide. The hardest part about my daughter going into a 24 seven care facility is that it takes one of those things that's very important to me and it takes it away, mm -hmm. right? It's the protect piece, you know? So I show up to this place and, uh, and I'm like, <laughs> Anyways, I just, I, sh I'm very overly cautious about her, her, I, I care. Right. 
But with my son, it's the, it's tough, right? Because he's 10 and, uh, you know, his sister's gone. So some of the things we've done, I think the hardest part is being at home. So we haven't really spent much time at home because, you know, we always have every night we'd have family dinner. Yeah. So I think what we've done as parents is here's another thing I did. I told myself I would never buy a, a video game console for the house ever. And I bought a PS5 for my son because you got to pick and choose your battles. If I think this could be a way that him and I can connect over Madden and he could kind of like free his mind a little bit playing a video game, like mm -hmm. I'm good with it. If you had asked me a year ago, I would have said no. So those are the type of things we're doing, not just buying him stuff, but like we're prioritizing more family time. We're, we're every single night we're at our in-laws for dinner. All we could do is just like love, 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 because he's going through, you know, a lot more than he gives off. Sure. And he's also gone through a lot before. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. So we have to try and be aware of that as parents. And it's hard. It, it is hard because we have our own shit going on. It's like, you know, like, for example, in, in two weeks is Ava's Kitchen. That's an annual fundraiser for pediatric cancer. It's March 2nd here. That's the one you put on, right? Yep. Yeah. And we've raised millions of dollars. And someone asked us, who's close to me, it was like, hey, you're not going to have it because she's in a home? I said, I said, we're absolutely going to have it because, because this, this event isn't about our family. It's right. about all the people we're helping. It's bigger than us. And like, this situation is not about me. It's about the family. Like, it's bigger than me. Do I need to prioritize my own health? Do I need to do my things? Yeah, but then afterwards, I'm I'm done feeling sorry myself for myself, and I got to show up for my kids, right, and my wife. Yeah, yeah. yeah. How are how's um like I always love talking to dads that have multiple kids. Like, what's communicating like to your son and your daughter? Like, how's it? How are they different? And how do you have to show up as a dad different with each of them? Oh, I mean, it's night and day. I mean, uh, you know, prior to this situation, yeah, right. My daughter's very girly. You know, is very interested in like shopping and and face products and whatever. Mm. <laughs> and my son is extremely like sports driven. So we connect through football, baseball, whatever, whatever. And, uh, you know, I speak to them and we, we react differently to different things. So like, for example, when I would do, we do jujitsu once a week before obviously all this happened, you know, for my son, I would train him a certain way and I would train my daughter a different way. I would talk to them a little bit differently and, and just kind of recognizing what um, they need from each one of us, yeah. each one of our parents. And like my, my wife is a badass, so. For that reason, we just connect and we talk about, hey, what do you think this person needs? What do you think this person needs? We try to do the best we can. Yeah, and do you guys do that kind of divide and conquer? Like, do is she, is your wife uh, like harder on your daughter and you're more soft with your daughter and then you're harder on your son? Like, how does that, how does that dynamic work? Yeah, I'm probably, uh, I'm probably, yeah, that's a really good question. I think uh, I'm probably the soft on both of them compared to her. <laughs> oh, you're the, she's, you're the soft yeah, one? She's, <laughs> that's she's, funny. Yeah, she's, she's, she's a, no nonsense, like get it done. But they, they, but that's like, but then they love her so much, right? Like, like anything she says goes for me. I'm just like on the side over here, <laughs> but yeah, I'm pretty laid back with most things. So that's um, interesting to me because I'm like within the business, I'm like the, the asshole or the hard ass, but then I'm such a softy for my son. Dude, do you know what it is? What is it? That's what? the same thing. Like, Cause you don't, you come off to me. Like you have that, like you're trained hard, hard ass business, everything else. But then the kids just melt you. Oh yeah, they melt me. I mean, I, I definitely my uh, it, unless we're playing sports, like yeah, I'm getting melted uh, across the board, right? Yeah. It's just in sports because Caden is such a competitor yeah. that uh, you know I need to feed off that. Energy. I could see that. Yeah. I could see me playing sports being tough on it, but all the other things I'm like such a softy. That's Dude, typically yeah. how it is. If uh, mom is because is your wife does your wife stay at home? Is she stay at home or she? Yeah, uh, that's probably why. I mean, I think when you when when the the parent that does most of the raising gotta maintain is gonna be the one that's the most like structured, and then dad pops in, he's like, let's have fun see you i don't know? feel that I, I don't feel that way at justin's house oh, yeah. courtney's home but i feel like justin's the hammer are you more hard than justin's kids? definitely the hammer yeah. well i think he may be but the hammer that doesn't mean he's more strict though yes it, he is well it depends so <laughs> yes he is bro i, I kind of come in after the fact you know okay. just to kind of regulate but yeah i mean i yeah i, I always check myself on that too because i i want to like I don't, I don't want, always want to be like the bad cop and come in and like you know discipline all the time but it is you know, you, you kind of yeah. find that dynamic and, and that's what you work out with your partner. Yeah, she, she works perfectly with me. And so, yeah, it's, it's just interesting. Everybody has their own kind of uh, configuration. Yeah, Katrina I mean, gives me shit. I mean, here's what I think about all the time. It's like, dude, on a regular basis, I'm just asking myself like, Hey, how are we doing, man? Like, yeah. like how am I doing? That's how so am I doing on these different areas? And if every day you just tell yourself like, Hey, I'm doing the best we can as a family, like, 
I don't know what more you could really do. You have, have you guys yeah. created, I think that's such a great point that you just brought up and you brought that up earlier too, about the, the, even checking in with like your daughter, like the biggest key to this is cause you're right. Like sometimes it'll have nothing to do with you. It's outside forces. The best thing that we can do is just communicate. And so are there things that you and your wife do or that you guys have created over years that like a, a practice of like to stay? Because yeah. a lot of people don't, a guy like you who's such a high performer, you've got two kids, you've got all these gyms and business stuff, right? you're a busy fucking dude. So I imagine that you guys have had to create some sort of disciplines around like, hey, every Friday we get to this or every night we do, like, do you guys have practices to make sure that you and her are always on the same page or you guys are checking in? Yeah, I mean, well, you got to think, you know, my wife and I met when we were 14. And we've been together ever since. And through that time, communication has been the key. And, and we've gone through some, you know, trauma, right. Or whatever you want to call it, hardship, whatever. Everybody's gone. Everybody goes through stuff. Yeah. So, um, but we just connect through it, right. We, we, we try and realize we're both on the same team trying to accomplish the same goal. We might have different approaches to it, but we got to come together to say like, like success for her is being the best mom and dad in the world, right. And, tr and raising really competent, amazing young humans. And if that's the same thing for me, then we just got to make sure we're communicating well, because we're on the same team and we do date nights, right? Once a week, at least. Yeah. Um, that's been something we instilled when Ava got sick the first time around. And uh, it's been something we do every single week. And it's been incredibly powerful for us because um, it's just an opportunity for us just to connect on whatever we have to talk about, you know? I think that's missed in a lot of relationships. I mean, I don't know how many of your friends are good about doing that, but I have a lot of friends that have kids and they, they you get uh, lost in the show. They get lost yeah. in, in the raising the kids. And I, I was, we were out at a, I don't remember what we did. We did like a date night with a good couple of ours and uh, they have two little ones and they were saying it was the first night they've been out in five years. I'm like, how the fuck do you have, keep a healthy marriage and not have gone out with your wife in five years. It's crazy. Yeah. And it starts to fester. It starts to grow. Right. And so I think that if you could do something like on a weekly basis, just, again, some of these stuff sounds fluffy, but it works. Like yeah. there's a reason why, you know, people recommend this is because it gives you a chime that you could allocate that you prioritize them. Right. Like, yeah. and they're prioritizing you and you get a chance to connect on things that are important to you. Yeah. Did this, has this made you reflect on our industry, the fitness industry, because of, you know, how, because body image and, and issues and eating stuff, I mean, our industry is plagued with it. After going through this or going through, are you looking? Do, do you look at our industry and go, okay, here's here's what I think what we're doing wrong, and maybe we need to change things. I don't know. I mean, it's it's super raw and super new to me, and I'm I'm still trying to figure out like my overall thoughts on everything. I think what we do is powerful. I think what we do changes lives, and I think the fitness space is incredibly important. I actually think the CrossFit space has done a really good job of not preaching like this skinny is whatever. Like they've really no. tried to bring forth like strong is beauty, especially for women. Like as far as I'm concerned, now yeah. this is my, I'm very biased here. I think the no, you're is, right. They, they did. They, yeah. they were more successful at getting women to lift weights oh, than yeah. any other attempt has ever, ever. So for that reason, right. If what CrossFit I think did for women is it focused on performance and it focused on <clears throat> aesthetic of strength and conditioning and gymnastics sure. and not just, Oh, can you be skinny? Yeah. Like when you see a girl who does CrossFit on the street, you know, she does CrossFit. Yeah. Like I, at least that's my opinion. I agree. I agree. They're, they're built, you know, you can see they're, it. They're, 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 and they're not being judged based on how skinny they are. They're judged based on, or at least however they judge themselves on this athletic look. So for that, I think Cross has done a good job, but it is it is something I'm I'm reflecting on and thinking to myself, like what 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 advice do I have for dads, moms, and people? And I'm just in the beginning of this journey, but I know I'm going to learn a lot more in the next six months and a year, and I'm going to continue to talk about it because just like leukemia, I've had countless people reach out to me who want advice on how to handle the same situation, and I've always been there to support them because you need to learn from other people who've gone through it. I want to be able to uh, be a voice for people who may not have the same type of network or, or microphone that I do to try and share with them what I've gone through and how, what I've learned. And, but right now it's just so new that I, I, I haven't been able to collapse, you know, condense it. You know, it's trippy about all of this. Uh, Cause I dived deep into this a while ago um, that um, anorexia and bulimia were, are both deemed a social contagion. I don't know if you knew that they didn't exist. They didn't exist until maybe Doug, you could look this up. Anorexia is a social contagion. I forgot what happened, but it started spreading and someone publicized like, oh, this is what people are doing. Uh, and then it became a disorder. Mm -hmm. Never existed. 
up until this particular point. Uh, and they've deemed it as like an example of a social contagion, which is really fucking wild when you think about it. Yeah. Yeah. That's really interesting. I mean, I wonder what else is on that list. Like you, uh, I wonder the pop, like, for example, I, I saw some research come out about people that are, um, uh, identify as a different sex. Oh, they, there, there's mm-hmm. an argument that that's also a social yeah, contagion because of its explosion, especially among the youth and especially among girls. Argument. I haven't done enough research on this to, to make a, you know, it's just from, from what I saw, it's like, you know, the amount of ch- ch- people that identify as a uh, different sex in, you know, 1985, whatever. Mm-hmm. Then it's like 2000. It's then it's like 2024. Yeah. It's like, yeah. now, is that because it's more socially acceptable? Is that because it's, uh, who knows why? It's just, that is, that's a good example that you're talking about. Yeah. Doug, did you find it? Yes. I what did. is that show? Would you mind throwing it up to the TV at the top so we can see? Yeah. Give me a second here. Yeah. No problem. Yeah. This, I, um, I, I remember reading about this and um, the strange contagious history of bulimia. There it was. It was bulimia. That was a social contagion. And so when did it start? Yeah, it looks like in the 1970s, this was first. So before uh, the 1970s, that didn't exist. Hmm. Did not exist as a disorder that yes, doctors were seeing. Now, do you think that's partly because, you know, this is going back to the point you made about uh, our generation compared to your parents and then the generation before that Great Depression generation, that we didn't even have the luxury to do that, that eating enough food to survive was already at so risk. Diets, so the, the diets social had, pressures were different too. Well, so you should read So I don't know what you're seeing in that article, Doug, but I, I know that diets existed well before this. So there were still, there were diets in the forties and thirties. Yeah. But I don't, I wouldn't categorize bulimia or anorexia. No, what I mean is that the awareness around, like I got to eat a particular way to lose weight or whatever. So or, prior to this time, these d- disorders were very rare. Uh, but after 1980, it became widespread in a very short period of time. Yeah, so that's what happened. So it's 1980, and then you see this douche explosion of girls who were having these eating disorders. Yeah, and was that because of social structure? Is that because bulimia? Because, for example, like no one had ever been exposed to it, so all of a sudden more people around them that's, heard about it. Yep. So then it, mm. it might have triggered this yep. that, that thing in them that, you know— it, It's so interesting um, to look at like society and how quick information can travel now. And it's, 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 you know, especially being in the health and fitness space, it's, it's something that I think we need to discuss. Well, what's important. So um, we did most of our careers uh, training just everyday people, right? right? So we didn't train athletes. We didn't train competitors. It was just everyday. We did. It was a small percentage. We did very small. It was mostly just everyday regular people um, in, you know, big box gym type stuff or, or private studios. And, uh, you know, 10 years into, and we all talk about this all the time on the show, 10 years into what we did, you realize like this has a lot less to do about what exercises you need to do and what the right diet is and much more to do about the cycle, the psychology, the behaviors, the mm-hmm. relationship you have with yourself, the relationship you have with food and the relationship you have with activity. And then when you figure that out, you become much more effective with your clients. All of a sudden people now make this a lifestyle. Whereas before it was very much like, do what I say, follow this workout. Here's your diet, do right. this. Oh, you don't do it. It's because you're not disciplined type of deal. Um, and so, you know, it, 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 I think the, the people that are best that can best communicate this are people who work as coaches and trainers with just everyday people for years and years and years. It takes a long time to figure out. I remember when I first saw the success of this, I had clients who also worked with therapists and then I would work with the therapist to work with the client. And then I was like, Oh shit, my approach was totally wrong. And then boom, success with the client. Yeah. You know, fitness and, and, and consistency is the key that I've recognized, right? Like we have this idea of like never zero. So like keeping momentum going with your movement, whether it's a walk, sure. a jog, anything, whatever. I mean, but you know, I don't know where, where I'm at. And this is just, maybe it's because I've explored a lot of different things. Like, so I had a mindset coach forever for competing in CrossFit and he would teach me how to understand what's in my control, out of my control, positive self-talk. Those are really important, valuable skills you can learn while in a hard workout. And I just feel like if we could, encourage more people to work out. This is just, I I, yeah. I, I drink the Kool-Aid hard. Like I just feel like the best gift you could give yourself is a hard workout where you learn to overcome some challenges because it makes real life challenges easier. And I just, I'm just convinced of that, at least for myself. Now there's so many other layers of that, right? And it depends on who the person is, but 
I think that if people just recognize that if they just went out and did something, I think a sedentary lifestyle adds to a lot of these other factors that happen oh, yeah, in life. Well, it has many parallels to like playing sports, right? And we talked about this the other day about like just the value of of kids playing sports, like oh, what, yeah. the, what they learn with overcoming adversity, getting picked last, like, you know, mm -hmm. trying your hardest and failing. Like there's so much, and that, the gym, the gym applies that. Like if you train long enough, you're going to fail. You're going to hit plateaus. You're going to have setbacks. You're probably going to get injured. You're probably not going to be the strongest. Like you de develop, can't, can't compare yourself to other people because yeah. you're going to, you know, inevitably meet somebody that's better and more disciplined than you, Yeah, you know? And so you have to kind of remove yourself from that identity on some level. Uh, yeah. There's so many lessons that are parallel to anything you're going to experience. So that's the argument I would make though, is that, is that I don't, I don't necessarily say that everybody has to train, right? Like I think that you could find that per same similar pursuit in in sports. But I think if you don't play sports, then you're really missing out if you don't find the gym at some point in your life because where else are you gonna get that right that those lessons? Well how many adults play traditional how many adults play sports? Right. Like, excluding like jujitsu. Let's just say jujitsu is not that's even yeah. a small percentage. Yeah, which which has only exploded in the last like eight years, right? But, <laughs> before but that's Joe still like before 1%. Joe Rogan, nobody was yeah. doing it. But like, you know, here's a really interesting concept. One of my friends said this to me and I, I was like, fuck, I was like mind blown. It was Kelly Starrett. He goes, you know, the sign of a good, healthy relationship with sport or something along that line where you don't burn the kid out, but you like, you, you push enough, but don't burn them out is when they're done playing sports, whenever that is like high school, college, whatever level, they, go practice they still would go play that yeah. sport. Yeah. 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 And I thought they about that for a while it. and I was like, <laughs> damn, I was like, that's powerful. Right? Like, yeah. Because imagine the people that played like, oh, I played college, uh, name the sport, yeah. yep. right? But they never like go play pick up basketball. Yeah, they're done. They're done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's like yeah. the people who go, hey, you can apply that to like, that. You know, how many people have you met that went to six or eight years of college and then they fucking stop learning. Yeah. They stop reading. Yeah. It's like they go bust their ass to get the school done just to get the degree, but then they resented like it the whole time them, versus- yeah enjoying that process and going because we don't know how to care for ourselves man that's why because workouts are not you know yeah. uh, it's not Shouldn't a form punishing of, yeah. it's not a self-care it's not for self-care it's for to look a particular way that's why i'm doing this i want to look this particular way. and if i look that way i'll be happy and if i'm not then i'm not going to be happy it's not people don't know how to care for themselves they really don't and care is not easy well, they, which no, it's, 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 another it's, way to say that is they're, they're entering into working out with already the wrong totally. mindset. That's yeah, I mean, for most people, like for me, I work out, I really, I'm, maybe it's because I have a physique that I'm comfortable with, but like I exercise to, to so that I could do those things I talk about, like the protect right. and provide. Like that, that's important to me. Like I never want my kids to ask me to do something I can't physically do it. Like if I can't, yeah, but you enjoy the you, process too. It's not oh, just the means to the end. Yeah, right? yeah. and that's yeah. also you've probably come, like I don't know about you, but I know that's not how I started here. Right. I started here insecure. That's right. I started here as the skinny kid that's who right. yeah got teased for being skinny, and I wanted the attention of girls, and so like very wrong place to start. And it took years of training to kind of come full circle with with that. So I imagine you're the same way. Yeah, right? I mean, yeah. I started off I was bigger, and then I got into Muay Thai, and it led into a bunch of cool stuff, and then CrossFit, obviously, but. You know, I think, and now my journey with jujitsu has been like incredible. I love, I absolutely love jujitsu. I think it has a lot of parallels to real life. Some days you're doing great. Some days you're getting choked out mm -hmm. and, and you <laughs> yeah. got to learn how to control yourself and, yeah. and, and get back on the mats, you know, yeah, stay calm. How, yeah. I, speaking of jujitsu, I found this as a, as a struggle. It, when I, so I did jujitsu for a little while. I heard while. you got, we got to get you back on the mats. Yeah, no, my, you, you, you train with my, my brother-in-law. Uh, he, he was telling me all about you and you guys uh, work out together sometimes, but uh, I haven't done it for years, but I do remember when I did it. I had to learn how to not use my physical strength in order to allow myself to learn the technique. Right. Did, did you have, to, cause you've been doing this for, you're a purple, brown, brown I'm belt. Brown. Okay. So you're very advanced now. Did you get, go through that period where you're oh, like, yeah. Oh, I, I got to stop muscling through all this stuff just cause I, you know, I'm, I'm stronger than everybody. You know what I think I, I love about, um, so obviously, you know, CrossFit, what I fell in love with was like, the high intensity workouts, but also the complexity. I enjoyed learning new skills, yeah. like walking on my hands, handstand pushups, whatever, like muscle ups. And then you get to a certain point when you're training it for so long that like getting better at your muscle up, even 2% is like very, very difficult when you get to a certain level. Sure. And so it wasn't unlocking that potential in me. Like I was getting the fitness, but I wasn't like learning something new mm -hmm. to your point. Like, like I finished school. Yeah. I wanted to continue to learn. And so I, um, in jujitsu, what I find the most 
coolest thing is that it's like a game of chess and you learn something new every single day. It doesn't matter how long you've been doing it for. And in the beginning, I really wanted to muscle everything. And I probably was a really poor training partner, if I'm being honest. But it took I me- I can a- only imagine. You're that, you're that white belt that probably hurt everybody. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> you I, spaz honestly, out and yeah. <laughs> I, was, I was probably the guy who was a terrible training partner. And now my goal, no matter who I'm rolling with, I want to be a good training partner. So if I roll with someone who's like legit, well, then mm-hmm. I need to give him that same push. Otherwise, he's not going to get much out of it. If I'm rolling with a brand new white belt, then I need to regulate my, my intensity and control that. But in the beginning, it's very hard, especially for a guy- especially for a bigger guy, because as soon as someone puts their hands on you, you're not very, you're not very used to it. Like it's very you want to foreign default to like using all your, well, yeah, because it's yeah. very foreign. Like how often, when's the last time you yeah. get in a physical space of like another dude. Right. Yeah. And, uh, so for that reason, I'm very grateful for my jujitsu journey. It's been a great way to unlock your mind too. Like I, I've been thinking about this a lot lately, like having like three things. So, uh, like you have your work, you have your family, And for a lot of people, they have like a third thing, but I find that if you could find a third thing that really allows you to be present and focused like jujitsu or like one of my buddies, a um, competitive shooter, like, like a, or golf, for example, we really got to hone in, right? You really got to be focused. I feel like you could show up in those other areas even better. So, uh, so do guy like you, or do you avoid, like, how do you do, do you do triangle chokes with your big ass legs? Are you able to do, or, or do you, okay. You still able, you just got to change the angle. I I don't, I got to change the angle. I don't, I don't do triangles as much, right? I play, you know. Because every body type, people don't know this, that they don't do jujitsu. You you can, you, your game, you can change it to your body type. Long, lanky, short, stocky. For sure. Yeah. If you're long and lanky, you're going to be better off with doing some triangles. You'll be able to wrap it up quicker. Um, like for me, I'm going to be better on, you know, side control and, and whatever. You're probably a Kimura machine. I would yeah, Kimura machine. For, yes. Uh, that's a, that's a good one for me. Uh, <laughs> or like some sit up sweeps from the bottom and different types yeah. of stuff. But, um, but jujitsu is cool because it's very humbling. You know, it, yeah. it doesn't matter how long you've been doing it for. It doesn't matter how good you are. You can always get caught. When was the first time you went in there, like strong, you know, CrossFit games champion, you know, Jason Kalipa, and then just the little skinny, flexible dude just put your ass i mean what, do you yeah. remember the first time it happened i i don't i don't remember the specific time it happened but it happened countless times right like, <laughs> like i just remember like you know just being like damn dude like because you think you're super fit and this is really what got me inspired so i got inspired to do jujitsu two reasons one is um i i retired from the sport of crossfit when ava got sick so i i i needed an outlet mm-hmm. that was one the other was I'd always walk through airports when I was traveling for CrossFit or whatever I was doing and people be like, oh dude, like I don't want to mess with you. Like yeah. they would always say that to me. I'd always think to myself, like I have a background in Muay Thai, but I was thinking to myself like, dude, I don't, I haven't developed many fight skills. Like I, I, I'm focused on fitness, not necessarily the fighting. Yeah. Yeah. And it always would like cause me like a moment of like, should I tell him like, maybe I wouldn't be that good at it? <laughs> like, <laughs> Let him assume. And yeah. so then then that's when I really wanted to get into jiu-jitsu is, is to develop this uh, self-defense and art that I think I could do for the rest of my life. Whereas Muay Thai was very, like, it was very aggressive. So I don't think I could have done it for very long. Yeah. yeah. So 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 what your, what's your game then? Side mount? Yeah. Attacks. Okay. Yeah. Like, well, if I'm, if I'm rolling, like if I really want to like win, if you want to win. Yeah. I'm going to get in like half guard, try and pass half guard, get to side control, try and hold them down there. Yeah. And then I'll probably say in side control, maybe go North South and do something with their arms. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. That's, that's, that's the big guy moves. That's, that's the, the strong big guy guys. Moves. Yeah. yeah. But if I'm playing bottom as a lately, especially in a gi, like I, I've been getting a lot more dynamic in a gi. It's been a lot of fun. Cause like you have a gi, no gi. It's, it's a very cool sport. And then recently I also got into the tactical games. Uh, which I was supposed to compete in this upcoming What's weekend. Yeah, I got to talk to you about that. Right. Yeah. Uh, I was supposed to compete this upcoming weekend, but uh, I, I, uh, I pulled out of that one because of yeah. basically I told the the guy who runs the event, cause he's done a lot for me. I was like, look, man, I can see my daughter on the weekends and there's no way I'm going to be shooting guns and doing fitness in Arizona instead of like being here to see her. Like, sure. you know, it's not like, happening. You're it's fine. not happening. Right. Yeah, yeah. Like, uh, you guys ever heard that thought? Like, will it matter in five seconds, five minutes, or five years? Yeah. You guys ever heard of that? No, yeah. I haven't. That's actually a cool way to look through that lens through things. So like, let's just say like you mm. bump me or whatever, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. Is that going to matter in um, five seconds? Maybe five minutes? Probably not. Yeah. Five years? Definitely. I won't even remember that you bumped me. Right, right. As an example. But that's the way no- people normally look at things in life, right? Will it matter? And you're like, oh, just brush it off, whatever. But what if it's the flip side? Like, what if it's like, will it matter in five years that you didn't go to your grandma's funeral of course, right. or that you didn't show up to a wedding because you were too busy. Right. Right. Those that's the, that's the way I've been looking at some things, right? Like, will it matter that I didn't compete in the tactical games five years from now? No. Cause I'm going to find another date to do it. 
will it matter that I wasn't able to show up every single weekend I could to see her? Yeah, it's going to matter to me, right? So that's something. That's a really cool lens. Mm -hmm. That's a real, I've never heard anybody say that before. Five seconds, five minutes, five so, years. So what are the tackles? So I'm assuming it has some kind, some kind of fitness component, and then it's you got like, to shoot targets. Scott, what we're going to do with Scott? Oh, yeah, what we're going to do with Scott? Hey, it's wow. shooting guns and being <laughs> yeah. fit. Like <laughs> that sounds yeah. cool to me. <laughs> it's um, it's uh, so one of the reasons why I have particularly fallen. I don't like that falling in love. That's a very, that's an intense. Too strong. One of the reasons why, yeah, way too strong. <laughs> yeah, I really like it. Yeah. Really like One of the reasons why I have enjoyed it is that it's unlocking another part of like, so if you look at like 10 general physical skills, like power, strength, endurance, stamina, flexibility, whatever, um, one of those is accuracy, right? Um, the guys that created the Dynamax med ball created like these 10 general physical skills. And accuracy is one of them. But in CrossFit and even in Jiu Jitsu, you never test accuracy no. much. Like maybe a, that's a fundamental skill, human skill by the yeah, way that you don't really test. Yeah. Right. Um, and so when I started getting, um, uh, introduced to this idea of shooting, it was really eye opening for me, especially under stress. So, you know, you do 50 burpees, try and so you're all exhausted shoot, and then you, gotta you shoot. feel exhausted. And what I enjoyed about it is that it really required me to like, control hone in yeah. control yeah, and work yeah. fine motor patterns while being tired and mm -hmm. so for that it was it's been a very cool journey i mean that's one of the things i think mm -hmm. I, that is so cool about the ice bath i think everybody that talks about it promotes it promotes all the other things but yeah. the ability to be in a stressful environment like that like the i'll never we did this like i don't know god how many years ago it was eight years ago justin was the only one that had gone through the wim hof train this was before ice baths became super popular right so this was a long time ago and we all did this competition and Justin was in there drinking a beer and like all comfortable for like whatever, 10 minutes. And Sal and I were like trying to muscle yeah. our way. And it was like, Flexing. I mean, and I tried to just, and I thought, cause I have like crazy discipline like that where I'll take myself to the brink and I just, I, I broke it like a minute and a half, but that was because I tried to muscle through it. I didn't know mm -hmm. how to calm myself down in this really and once you learn how to do that, you all of a sudden unlock this potential to sit in there for as long as you really want to sit in there. That's this, the best part of ice bath. I think that people just don't talk about that for sure. That ability like translates into so many aspects of your life to be under distress, just duress and stress like that in, in an environment and to be able to calm yourself oh, down is it a very dude, powerful thing to be able to do decisions in that state for sure. Like it's so funny. Cause like people talk about the ice bath and like cold plunges have gotten super popular in the last yeah. couple of years, like jujitsu, boom, yes. Yeah. Uh, cold plunge, boom. Yeah. I mean, but yeah. a lot of this stuff has been around for forever many many years yeah. um i put up this thing the other day i was talking about it this is a while ago i was like look you can say what you want about the cold plunge you could talk to me you could negate the science of anti-inflammatory yeah, yeah, uh markers, brown yeah, fat yeah. uh you i don't really care what cold you talk about proteins yeah. yeah the bottom line is it's something hard that i don't want to do and That's by right. doing it i'm going to get better because of it That's like it. i went in the cold plunge this morning i absolutely hate the cold like i hate it you never learned to like it yeah. Ever. Yeah. 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 It never gets it. easy. I hate it, but 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 it but it makes me feel like I'm accomplished when I get yeah. out. So I don't care what the science says. It doesn't matter to me. Should I do it before workout, after workout? It doesn't matter. Like is it not yeah. like that's really exactly how we get asked about it all the time mm. because there's so many people going viral now of trying to debate the science. Wait of, six hours, yeah, like, yeah. you know, or whatever. It's like, dude, you guys are way overthinking this shit. You're yeah. way overthinking this shit. The challenge is just being able to do it, and that's where the value is. The value is can you get your ass mm -hmm. in that freezing cold water when you don't want to do it mm -hmm. and still do it anyways and then have the discipline and control to regulate your breathing and calm down to where you can fucking sit in there for four or five minutes like that yeah. is it who gives a shit about anything else for sure yeah, that's because everybody wants to we want to attach everything to fat loss or muscle gain that's yeah. why yeah. what are the yeah. fat loss and muscle gain yeah, effects like who cares and, and, and you know that you know back to your point um i think i wonder what that's going to do for the future of our youth with what you just said like, because what gets clicks and what gets oh, yeah. mm -hmm. attention is what you just said. Fat loss, muscle build gain. muscle gain. Yeah. Um, and it's a fine line, right? Because who are we to say that your goals of fat loss or muscle gain are not appropriate? Like, if those are your goals and that's important it's, to you. It's, like, not that, it's not that it's not appropriate. It's that it's not complete. So fasting, let's see, here's a better, easier example. Fasting. Yeah. Can you lose body fat through fasting? Well, yeah, you, you can. But that's not the value of fasting. The value of fa it's existed for thousands of years. It's a it's a detach it's a way to detach from an earth earthly desire or need. It's a spiritual practice. When you fast, you're denying yourself a food. And of course, this is within the context of a healthy individual. For sure. When you're fasting, you're denying yourself this thing. And so you 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 develop yourself differently. That's the value. The fact that you lose weight on I me, mean, you could you could lose weight a million different ways. 
That's not the value, but that's how they sell it, right? Cold plunge, what's the value? Oh, cytokine production, anti-inflammatory, um, whatever. Brown no, no, no. fat, all that shit. The value <laughs> is it's cold and it's freaking hard. Right. And you're choosing to do something really hard. That's the value of it, yeah. right? So this is that's that's the thing. It's not a complete picture. Exercise, build muscle, burn body fat. Yes, two things that it does. Well, but what about all these other things that it does? Well, not a part, complete picture. part of that too is that the and you said this earlier that and you, to your point, like who am I to say that you know your goal to lose twenty pounds is not right or not fair? Well, the problem is so many people set out with that goal thinking that the end result's going to make them happy. Oh, uh, yeah. That's where that's the a whole other layer. Yeah, exactly. Like, <laughs> like nothing wrong with wanting to get shredded for summer. Have fun. And, and the fact that we have the the knowledge and the science to right. apply diet, nutrition, and exercise and to be able, that's cool. But if you think that it's going to make you a happy person because you did that, you're fucked. And it is the wrong yeah, goal. That's a really, um, I mean, that's like a whole nother like next step. And one of the things that I've noticed, so we are on week 20 three now week 23 in a row that I've hosted, uh, we at a minimum one free train hard men's club workout a week for the last 23 weeks. In a what row. is this exactly? You've brought this up a couple times. What is this? Men's is club? Giuseppe going? Who's going? No, yeah. no. It's uh, it? uh, Julio, but I don't know if he goes to this or not. He's got the, your, um, your brother in law. Yeah. 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 He's came. He just came with me. We were in a parking lot on Saturday. Oh, morning right. He did. I did see pictures. Yeah. Of this. All right. So what is it? So, um, the reason why I'm bringing this up is because of what you just said. Uh, it is my, my role. You know, one of my goals is to support my local community in being as fit and as capable as possible. And I feel like I wasn't doing the best job of that. Yes. I own gyms. Is that helping? Sure. Do we put out online content? Sure. But what else can I do within my community to help men in particular that I can relate to? Not, I'm not saying this is not do women should be training hard and doing it too, but I can relate to men and what they're going through. And so I wanted to start with them. And so I just put out like, Hey, we're going to do a men's club workout. Let's get five guys started in my garage. Then I got seven, then I got 10, then I got 20. Then all of a sudden people wanted to do it that I didn't know. And I didn't want them to come to my house. <laughs> so, <laughs> so which is totally fair. Yeah. And so now, uh, we have an email list. We have a text thread. I send out a message on Thursday. It's always been free. There's never been any money transacted. There's never been any ask of anybody at all, except for to come and put in your best effort. That's it. And, um, you know, now we have probably 50, 60 guys wow. every week, um, just in parking lots, pushing up hills, doing whatever they're doing. Like we, we do something different every week. Um, do you, so, and you organize the workouts and what's going to happen. Yeah. Uh -huh. So essentially when people show up, it's like, it's like this, um, we have, uh, you know, I bring out a clock, I bring out, I have an AED, I, I bring out a speaker and we do it like in the parking lot of a library or the parking lot of a, this or inside of gymnasium or up a hill. Uh, we've done hill sprints countless times. And I just say, guys, like my goal here is just to, is just to do something hard together. I feel like we can connect. Uh, let's, let's put out our best effort. If you do, we always do EMOMs or AMRAPs. So no one ever knows, like there's never a four time workout. So no one knows if you did five reps or 50 reps, right. as long as we're doing it together. Oh. And we have gear, we have sandbags we bring out. Um, I brought sleds, we do plates and I just transport them in my truck and we just do hard stuff together. And then what's, what's really been the coolest part, which is why I wanted to bring this up is that after we're done every single week, it started off with like two people just like grabbing a cup of coffee, like low key, right? And then it's three and then it's four. Now, every time after we have about 15 guys that just go to a local coffee shop and just shoot the shit and talk about what's happening in their lives. And you got police officers with tech gazillionaires with whatever, and they don't know each other from Adam, right? They're just guys going through stuff and they're connecting through this shared experience of doing something hard. And it's that next layer of like the weight loss, right? Mm -hmm. It's having somebody to talk to about even in some of the conversations we're having today. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good That's deal, cool. man. That's, That's awesome. That's really cool. That's so cool. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you guys got to come to one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No. I don't work out like that, bro. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck that. <laughs> we, yeah. we chopped some trees down. Dude, yeah. we, got this, yeah. we got this one guy. Yeah. We got one guy. He's a buddy of mine. It's so funny. He only works out once a week with me. Yeah. That's it. And he throws up like every other time. Yeah, <laughs> it's, like, it's like, come on, man. Oh, you got to be like, convinced now. Yeah, I want to yeah, yeah, no, yeah, yeah, He lost me at AED. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, you know, yeah. we bring some stuff in my truck. He just slid that in yeah, there too. Yeah. Like, I got the AED yeah, there. Yeah, like, I heard that. Yeah, kind of a workout for me, dog. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just trying to be, yeah. trying to be safe. He was all low key yeah. under that. He said that. He just slid it in there. AED's there too. Like, oh, dude, fuck. You got to bring the AED, bro. I don't want to be there. 
<laughs> Good deal, Jason. But you guys, you guys should come out, especially with you guys and in, in, in the kids, right? What yeah. I really, I really want to do the dinner, dude. Sure. I really want to support that. I think uh, one of the years we were, I don't know where we were at, but I would love to to actually help and support that cause. We didn't get to jump on board with you on that last year. I'd like to. Well, I'd like to use up. our platform to support that. Yeah. March second. So March second, oh, we, we have an Arnold. It's, it's yeah, the, we're we're out of town. It's the uh, weekend of the Arnold. Yeah, but we have some great live auction items, and um, you know, maybe we, 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 we can donate something that you auction. That yeah, to donate to auction. Yeah, or? yeah, yeah. You, well, you what's guys a do better way? What's or? the best way to support you? Yeah. Um, I mean the neat. So okay, well, let's talk. So Ava's Kitchen is an annual fundraiser, so we can give some context. <laughs> this is year seven. It's with Chef Michael Mina, and we invite like we get like four or five like world's best chefs. So like right now, I think this year we're having a top chef winner. Like we've had, we've had all, we've had a lot of really great chefs because of uh, Michael Mina and these other chefs network, not because of us. And every dollar that's raised goes to an organization called Nigu, which is a never ever give up organization. And the goal there is to put smiles on kids' faces. So they do joy jars, they do all kinds of stuff. It's not, it's not for the cure, it's for the care is the theory there. Okay. So, um, the best way to support would just be to go to Ava's kitchen.org. And if you want to, if people want to just leave a donation, they can. Um, but the event's coming up like in two weeks. Okay. Yeah. Well then that's what I'd like to do. I'd like for us to, from now till then, we'll, we'll make that like our shout out and we'll drive to that. I'd love to impact that best, most we can. Yeah, man. I mean, that'd be great. You guys yeah. I, it would be great to have you guys there next year. It's just a really cool event, you know, great food, great people trying to raise money for a good cause. And, um, you know, Ava's not going to be there this year. It's going to be pretty heavy, but that's part of the journey, man. Like that, that just gives you even more reason why we got to do this kind of stuff. Because I do think part of this had to do with some of that and other kids are going through the same type of stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah. if we have the financial means to be able to help them, like, let's go. You know, something too that I think is important is just so, I mean, you, you, you seem to have pretty good empathy, but to even give you more, like, it's so cool. You said something earlier that I actually, I'm trying to get better at Katrina and I, we have a I wouldn't say we're every night have we been consistent with having a dinner together. And it's crazy how much that's become the norm in a lot of households, including my own. And I think the fact that you guys have dinner every night, you saw something that you may not have even seen with a lot of these households that families don't have dinners together. Dude. Right. So, so imagine, you know, as, as bad as it is right now and as yeah. rough as a shitty time you're going through, Imagine if you were like probably 80% of the families out there that don't have dinners sitting together. Well, so one family I connected to um, had an older girl. She was 16. This is this is actually terrifying. And this individual, um, long story short, she couldn't stand up anymore. That's how fatigued she was. Wow. And you you would if you had asked me this a year ago, I would have been like, bro, how did the parents not notice yeah. that this girl can't stand up? Never again. And something that it's so funny because the older I get, I always tell myself, don't pass judgment. Don't, you don't understand, <laughs> right, right. like have empathy. Like the older I get, the more I realize I don't know as much as I think I know. Right. Yeah. And there's always, but it's easy to pass judgment. You say, how could this family not know like that she had an eating disorder when she like passes out in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. Right. But imagine like paint this picture. You have a 16 year old girl that has her own driver's license. She gets up in the morning. She grabs an apple and a cup of coffee. You're like, okay, that's fine. I think she's gonna be eating at school. She'll have lunch right, at school. Right. You don't know that. Yeah, but then yeah. she goes to lunch at school. Maybe she doesn't eat anything. And then all of a sudden she has school sports. So then you assume she eats before sports. Then she comes home and maybe has just a little snack with you. And then she goes to bed. But you already assumed she had a meal before sports yep. and a meal at lunch. Yep. And so it's not as simple as it seems, right? No, no. Or then add a layer, so layer. Maybe mm. you're a family who is busy and mealtime at different times, and it's kind of thin for yourself at your house, and kids go to their room and go eat or in front and, of the TV. And that's and a lot of teenagers. They spend time in their room yes, a lot, or they'll yes. wear baggy clothes. You can't necessarily tell. Yeah, and I think the social media thing is something that I Bro, think- Bro, I was just going to ask you, are you, how are you with that with your kids, with social so media? My, so my daughter doesn't have, I mean, you know, look, she had Pinterest, and she has- I, I do not want to mistake. I am not naive enough to think that she has not had access to these things. Right, right. right. But on her phone, we had deleted. She had TikTok for a little bit, like this, like a year ago. We deleted it because we we thought something was coming up. Right. And she had no other social platforms. But I I don't know if that's necessarily the the good solution either because now um, instead of teaching moderation and and re understanding, I'm just saying no. 
And I don't know if that's good because this is the world we live in and the world we live in has these things in it and we need to shepherd the kids through learning how to deal with them. So I don't know if the right answer is just like, no, you can't have it on your phone. But I do think that social media, especially for young girls, for is kids. something that we yeah. need to we need to really pay attention to. You're, you're touching on something though that I, I wrestle with a lot right now. Um, they have I, data, I, by the way, on this now, finally. They didn't mm -hmm. have data before. But I, I mean, what mm -hmm. he's saying that I think is so important too because it's really easy to be one extreme or the other as, as a parent. Like either you don't give a shit and just let your kids do whatever or right. you have the attitude of like, no, can't have it. And then they go behind your back and they do ghost profiles and they do all this shit that you have no idea about and they do it anyway. So it's like, what is the right balance? I So my son's only four. And so obviously I don't have social media as an issue, but I do have the iPad yep. and even little games. A great example. And and I wrestle with that. I, so originally the the big joke when, before he was born, I used to say, my son's not going to see a television for like 10 years. Like right. I had this. And like, you see parents like on an airplane or something with an iPad, you're like, yeah. not, that's yeah. not going to be yeah. me. Yeah. No, I'm never yeah. going to do that. Go try so, to fly with one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I said, never. And then now I've, I've allowed in there. Now what's great about it is, I, I was aware enough to know of the the dangers of it, the addictive uh, things, his behaviors when he's with it or not with it. And so I've chosen more of like moderation and, and learning to integrate it and, and it not be the end all be all. And that we very much so go through times where a week will go by and he won't ever have access to it and we'll be doing X things. Now, I've learned as a parent a lot of it is on my responsibility to, to just because what I've he's four. So yeah, he wants to play on his iPad or play games, but if daddy engages and goes, let's go wrestle outside or let's go build your Legos or like, it's not hard to convince him to do that. Yeah. And so a lot of that responsibility versus saying all no or all yes is actually just being aware as a dad or a parent and going, man, I know it's really easy to default and just allow them to mm -hmm. entertain themselves on that, but I don't want that. And so the best way to control that, in my opinion, is to is to control it by you doing things with them, which it sounds like. For, for sure. I mean, yeah. the, the technology component is, I think, something that we as parents need to really pay attention to for both sexes. Meaning yeah. for my son, if he just plays video games all day, which like I said, he never had a video game console until three days ago. And now he's been playing Madden and I've been, we've, we're giving him a lot more slack than we normally sure. would. But I think these young boys, they go to school, they're sitting down all day, which <laughs> sucks. Yeah. Then they come home and they're playing video games, which is just sed sedentary. And they have this pent up, like, I just feel like young boys, they have like this energy that yeah. needs to get out. And if it's not brought out through sports and through activities, I think it comes out in a lot of negative ways. And I think video games are adding to that. Yeah. And not to mention all the violent ones and all that kind of stuff. But with girls, I don't necessarily think it's the video games that are a big social problem. Media. It's the social media. Well, did you yeah. did you see the clip that is going around? I've heard Jordan Peterson say it many times. I don't know how much of his content you've consumed or not, but Jordan Peterson talks about what video, why video games are so addictive to young boys, because it emulates this this dragon or thing that you have to conquer and levels and so that, and why they like it so much is because we're we are wired as young men to do that in real life. Mm. And so it's giving them this false sense of their doing it's it. It's a digital right? challenge and conquest and you beat it, but it's all digital. It's not real. Right. Yeah. And, it's, and it's, you're robbing them of potentially doing that in real life yeah, by allowing them to just do that. Yeah. The two big dangers for the boys is uh, video games and pornography because oh, they, both, they both rob young men of our natural drives. One of them is to, get women to like you, which is an important thing. Like that's not, not that's not, not important. It's very important to learn how to get women to want to be with you. That's a very, that's why men where a lot of women like a guy that's respected. It's because, well, he's doing something right. 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 So there's that, that take that away with pornography. And then video games is me going out and conquering or conquest or challenge and overcoming. But now it's not a video game. I'm not building anything. I'm just building this thing on Minecraft or whatever. I'm not really out there doing something. So we're just, we're, we're robbing them of, and the creators have really hacked into this. Yeah. Like of they, course. they understand the psychology of this and they've learned to, to feed yeah. that open yeah, loop. Like, have you read the book boys adrift? Mm -mm. 
So Boys Adrift speaks on this particular thing. And it was it was written in 20, like 15. So it's still a little bit outdated. But I, I just finished it a little bit ago. And it's very fascinating. They talk about it was uh, it was done by a, basically a, a traditional doctor, like a, a, a pediatrician. And he talks about he saw these signs of ADD, ADHD. And they started like trying to get deeper, deeper. Anyways, he talks about these several factors, one being video games, the other one being pornography. And he said that on average, if you took like a 16 year old's phone out of like 100 kids or something like that, like. 70% of them had more than a thousand pornography photos on her. So I, I don't wow. want to butcher the quotes, but you could pull it up. I'm sure it's called boys adrift, but it's, it's a very, um, it's a, it was very alarming, you know, book. And then, yeah. but for the girls, I think it's social media, dude. And, and then also like it, the clicks, right? It, because you, now you, you, it's, it's very clickish. And so, yeah, yeah. you know, if you're in school and, so dopamine hit every time they get a like or comment and yes. then the type of stuff you get likes and comments, the risk, right. the more risque or the crazier type of stuff that you post, the more attention that you get. So it's this feedback loop that they get. Oh, I have seen this book actually. Yeah. Boys Adrift. And the one I'm thinking of is the the blue one. I don't know if the red one is different or not, but um, yeah, that one right there. That's yeah. what I read. Yeah. So the the five factors and he goes into a, a bunch of different things, but you know, to your point, I think, I, I think it's just something we need to be aware of. Like with technology, technology is beautiful. I mean, we're using technology right now yeah. and it's incredible, but it also comes with some downsides, especially the loss of like real connection with people. Yeah. That's it's, why I think, I think your question that you were asking yourself and the one that I find myself asking myself a lot is that I don't think the answer is to completely, you know, hide it from them or tell them no. It's to learn to teach moderation, you know what I'm saying? And and, and that, that's, even though my son's only four, we try and have these kind of higher level conversations with them uh, about the the iPad, about using it and just delay having- Delay the exposure. Yeah. And, and that's it. I say delay the exposure, yeah. introduce it in very small increments. How yeah. old are your kids? Uh, I have 11 and 13 year old. Oh yeah. yeah. So you're- So well, I'm like just getting through, yeah. So you're playing the, all the sports the right weeds. now. I'm all in the weeds with it, yeah. yeah. Are you playing all the sports right now? Yeah. Well, the, so my kids are actually in gymnastics. And so- they're, Really? Yeah. We're starting out gymnastics and starting to move into team sports. Uh, it's two boys, right? Two boys. Oh, bro. Those guys are going to be little monsters. They already are. They are already you know, flipping and doing- They like crazy. gymnastics, huh? Yeah. They do. Yeah. They, they're you know, really good. They're, they're really getting into it. So, uh, but yeah, I, they, of course, all their friends are doing like conventional sports. And so it's kind of a little bit hard in that sense that like, you know- they're not having the same conversations with their group of friends and, and you can't really go to be a spectator even at the gymnastic events. Yeah. It's like kind of a, a difficult aspect to it, but like just the, in terms of just seeing their fundamental strength, their athleticism, oh. like it's just, it's what, fifth it's and eighth grade? Insane. Is that what it is? Uh, eighth grade. Well, so eighth, he's almost in high school. Yeah. So yeah. eighth grade. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. Wow. Yeah. That, that's, you know, what's interesting about that. I, I raced BMX bikes growing up and when I got to high school, I, I switched to football, but BMX was always that same way for me where I was, I was good at it. I would I'd be on like a circuit or whatever, but I never had anything to connect with other people at school about because I was doing something that they had no. So unique. It's so unique, right? Yeah. It's, it's, they, they can't, we couldn't have a conversation about it. Yeah. yeah. But that's a great foundation, man. They're going to be able to take that gymnastics. Oh, yeah. so gymnastics is the best. Yeah, yeah dude. They're going to do all kinds of stuff. That's why. I, I know. Yeah. And they're really good. So watching yeah. them already, like, do the stuff. I'm like, oh, you know, bro, they're going to be so good. You know, they have data now on, on smartphones, which we didn't have before. But the data now shows you want to wait until high school to give your kid a smartphone. Yeah. At least the, until high school. So, don't even let them have one. Mm -hmm. So here's an interesting. So I, 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 my son's 10. We got him a, uh, or he's nine. He turns 10 in a month. Uh, we got him an iWatch. Mm -hmm. He doesn't wear it. Mm -hmm. I wish he did because I want to be able to track him. Like if like if, wherever he's, and I want him to be able to uh, call on there if he was like at a friend's house or something and needed something. But he has no, there's no like, um, there's no apps or anything on it. It's just yeah. like right. uh, able to you call, text, text and, that's about it. and like, yeah. so if he's yeah. at a friend's house, he could say like, hey, I'm ready to go home. Or yeah, yeah. if he's at baseball and I mean, we're always there with them. But like, so that was something we tried at 10 or nine, maybe it was too early. I don't know. And then my daughter, it's like when she's out places, it gets, it's, it's tough because it's all the friends start to have it. And oh, I know. Also, bro. Yeah. Like, you know how it goes. Like, Oh, I know. Yeah. I know. Cause then they feel, like, they feel like, they feel like a extra uh, uh, ostracized, ostracized, yeah. ostracized because yeah. they don't have it. Like, listen, here's the deal. The, yeah. I, I, I had to come full circle with this cause I was like that too. And then mm -hmm. I realized something. Um, if you live the way you're supposed to live in this world, you're going to be sick, fat, unhealthy, 
depressed and anxious. Yeah. Yeah. So yes, they're going to be it's ostracized. That's the, the point. Against them. Yeah. The point is that they don't live in this world. That's I mean, the point. I, I mean, I think that's and the, that's the shitty thing. To, it's it's shitty, but it's true. The key yeah. for us dads is to is to be able to convince them. It's they, not just convince. You have to do it. Be like well, everybody else. So that brings up another really interesting topic that I have, like the homeschool idea. The like uh, it's it's a very interesting. Like I don't know. I was talking to this guy Ben Alderman. He's a close friend of mine. And, this idea of like the new modern school. I don't know if you guys have heard of like Acton Academies and this this additional next layer. Have you guys looked into mm -hmm. any of this stuff? No. So you have like your traditional public school system, yeah. right? Then you have like, let's just say a private school system. Sure. Yeah. Now there's this, uh, essentially, uh, and I was called out on this. I said that, oh, you're, you're doing the non-conventional way. And I told this guy, he was the homeschool. Yeah. He's like, well, actually, let me correct you on that. This is the most conventional way like this is the most old school way of yeah, teaching yeah, yeah. is homeschool yeah, yeah. before the Rockefeller before <laughs> traditional schooling came around yeah, I was like yeah. I was like oh I was like all right that's so is it uh, unschooling is that like the same thing were they like the, it's more led child by the led. Yeah, child led by the well, things they're interested in and well yeah so you have the homeschooling the private the uh, public and then there was this model um, from Matt Boudreau do you guys know who that is mm -hmm. so Matt Boudreau and uh, it actually Tim Kennedy has one they're, they're called Acton Academies I looked into Tim Kennedy's. And unfortunately, it's in yeah. Austin, well, he has yeah. one in Cedar Park, oh, but yes? Acton, okay. uh, Cedar Park, uh, uh, Texas. Texas. Yeah, yeah. Um, but essentially, what it is, there is no grades. Um, there is some structure, right? There's like uh, teachers, but it's not so like grade based. It's not like you might have a fifth grader with a. There's some charter schools like that. It's it's too. like that. Yeah. It's a whole different. You either way of know something at. or you don't. That's what I, that's how you, that's how you go through those. Yeah, and and, and it's it's interesting. You're not trying to put these kids like in specific boxes. Are you familiar with unschooling? What unschool no. Okay, so Ben Greenfield, one of our oh, yeah. friends, yeah, yeah. he unschools his kids, which is this. Yeah. So what he does is it's he has two boys, right? Yeah, yeah. It's led by their interests, and he teaches mathematics, history, science through real practical things. So they want to learn science. We're we're cooking a recipe today, and then they because they, they're into cooking. Yeah, because they like cooking because they they enjoy cooking. So he teaches the science so of ratios, the yeah, and temperature of boiling, and, uh, everything. So he teaches the science through chemistry he want they want to learn math they get they hire a construction worker to come to the house they build a fort and they do math through building the fort and so he uses real life practical things to teach all these and he shoot lets them choose so if they're his boys are into music so he teaches all kinds of things through music so yeah he uses the things that they're interested in and then he'll outsource if he needs to or he will teach himself He'll teach them the skills through that. It's really yeah. a brilliant. The, the, I mean, if I if I was a like a stay at home dad, and I, I would love to the, do the that. The question I would love with to do all that. this stuff is uh, for the parents how 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 far are you willing to go? Because it's all hard. Right. It's all hard. So <laughs> yeah. it's like way easier to follow yeah. the convention. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah. Like when I say conventional, I mean the standard, right? Yeah. So like, yeah. oh, you send them off to school. Yes. Now we got some time. I'm going to go to work or whatever. Oh, we're going to do homeschooling. Well, that's even more work. Oh, we're going to take away electronics. That's even more work for me. Oh no, social media even more work. So the realistic question is like, okay, what are we willing to do? Because it's going to make, it's going to be harder. Right. It's going to be harder for us. And so what are we willing to do? And then that's where you what find our hard answer. lines and yeah. Yeah. choose your hard, right? Well, it's, it, it's, um, a friend of mine is going through a similar journey where she's like, what she said to me, I thought really resonated. She's like, you know, I'm so good at my business, whatever. And then all of a sudden I chose to homeschool my kids and I suck at this. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, oh man. Yeah. Like, but you know, um, just using a video game example, just real quick on this one, like getting Caden a PS5 was the last thing I thought I would be doing a year ago. But there is some pros that I, I, I used to say, Hey, if you go to a friend's house, if you go to grandma's house, you could do it, whatever, anywhere yeah. else, but our house. Cause mm -hmm. at, at home, I don't want you to use that as a crutch. I want to be able to go play outside, go sure. jump on the trampoline. Yeah. But then the thing is, one of the things I didn't realize, like he wouldn't necessarily have friends come over as much because mm. they would be like, they want to play video games. Well, what they want to do is like at his friend's house. And this is, I'm actually okay with It's like, they would go out and they'd play baseball. They'd go play sports until it got super dark and then play video and games. And then play video games. That's how I grew up. And yeah. they would do it Same. together. Yeah. And it's just, it's just one of those things where like, as a parent, like just like looking at it through different lenses yeah. and perspectives, like that is cool to have all the friends come over, get exhausted 
mm -hmm. then come in and play Madden together. But what isn't cool is like being addicted to it and playing up, you know. Like, yeah, or you're by he, yourself and you're playing with your friend that's way over there. And it's yeah. Awesome. Nobody so he's to... he's old enough and you laid a good foundation that you're going to be okay. Like So I what I did with my son was I bought the original Nintendo. Ooh. So it's we like. We had a Nintendo Wii you, back in bro, the day. Bro, so I bought the mm -hmm. original NES system. And it's at that <laughs> point. Blow out the, 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 the like, si Yes. Yeah. And I, you know, it's so cute. I got videos of my son. He, I've taught him how to do that, right? So yeah. he, he thinks that we have to do that every time before yeah. we play the game. But what I've noticed, and this is how crazy, this is how far the science or psychology has come in in gaming today. His little iPad apps, like Angry Birds or any game, are, is far more addictive than the original Nintendo. At that point, we were just figuring oh, out man. how to put graphics on the TV and make the game work. Yeah. We weren't, we weren't unpacking the psychology and the science so of how to, how to keep them, how to keep them. So, and it's wild to see the difference. If I if we give him some time to play a game on his iPad, you I have to repeat or go over and take from him or say, okay, one minute, then you're off. If I am playing a Nintendo, I can literally middle of the level, hit pause and say, oh, let's go. We got there. And he'll just walk away from it. It's wild to see the difference of that. And so I've allowed him to do that. Like we play Nintendo to, and it's him and I's time together as we'll play Nintendo together. And it's great because it, it feels, if he says he wants to play games, him and dad go upstairs and we go in my room and we play a little bit of regular NES and I can walk him away from it. No problem. Yeah, man. I think all of us are just trying to do the best we can with what, like, you know, and, yeah. and we're just trying to show up. And I think just for that alone, like if you're just trying to show up as a parent, like you're, you're already ahead of the game, bro. You're, you're already you're way already ahead of the You're thinking about this stuff. That's like, what, what is Arthur Brooks was yeah, famous for saying like, that. Bro, if you're worried and you're thinking you care, about this, like you're, you're ahead of the game. Yeah, it was a uh, Arthur Brooks, good friend of ours. By the way, if you've never met Arthur Brooks, you have to meet him. I think Change he's one of the most amazing humans. I, that's a, Harvard professor, expert on what makes people happy, economist. Uh, he's, I mean, the guy's written yeah, best-selling yeah. author he, and. He got into Brilliant. he got into an Uber one time, and a, a new dad asked him that was asking him about that since obviously he's this Harvard professor, brilliant guy, and he studies all this. He says, "Hey, I'm mean, I just I want to be the best father." What's you know asking him like, "What are the best five tips or what that?" And he says, "You're already halfway there." And he's like, "What are you talking about? I'm, my son's not even born yet or what that." He's like, "The fact that you care is right. already half the battle. So like, you're already going to be a good dad. It's a matter of like how good of a dad you're going to be at this point." I was like, "Oh man, that feels so good just to hear that because." Yeah. We do. Sometimes we can beat ourselves up so much of like, am I doing this right? Should I restrict it completely? The fact that you think about it, you've already won most of the battle right there. Because so many parents don't even fucking think about it. You know? Yeah, man. That's all that's in your control too. Like, especially like with everything going on right now, I'm just thinking like, what's, you know, taking it day by day, focusing on what's in our control and really just trying to have a positive outlook. And, and I think those are the things that like are within your control. Like, and you learn those from competing in sport. Like totally. if you worry about your competitors, if you worry about the whatever, like, you're never going to do well because you're 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 anxious over something that you have zero control over. Yeah. Like, you know, hundred yeah. percent. Yep. Yep. Jason, good time seeing you, man. Yeah, yeah. appreciate yep. you coming on the show. Yeah, great again, to man. have you on, yeah. man. Yeah, and I, uh, thank you so much for sharing what you're sharing with us. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, yeah. Here we are. Always good time seeing you, bro. Always good time. Yeah. Thanks again.